Check, check, check. One, two, three. Good morning. I am Councilmember Donovan Richards of the 31st District in Queens and the Chair of the Committee on Public Safety. Thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the members of the Public Safety Committee who are here, Councilmembers Lanceman, Vallone, Cabrera, and Powers. I want to make something perfectly clear before I begin. I am fully supportive of the NYPD's development and expansion of a citywide neighborhood coordination officer program. My role here is to conduct oversight, and sometimes that does mean asking tough questions. Today I do have some questions, but for the most part I want the police department to have an opportunity to share with the city what makes a neighborhood policing model better than traditional forms of policing that we have seen here in this city. I don't think it's any secret that I think the strategy of the, of the past broken windows policing and the NYPD's overuse of stop, question, and frisk have had no benefit for public safety but have endangered a lot of mistrust of the department from some of our most vulnerable communities. That's why I think what Commissioner O'Neill is doing with the NCO program is the right way forward. Expand the number of officers whose jobs it is to build relationships in the community so that they know what the problems are who they can go to when they need help solving a problem and thinking outside the box in terms of preventing problems before they escalate to where arrest and enforcement are the only options. In my district, the NCOs from the 100th Precinct did, an amaz did amazing work in helping to set up a gate outside our local park so that people couldn't get in at night to drink or use or sell drugs or cause problems. I also had a great story uh, over the weekend of some NCOs who uh, helped a senior who um, unfortunately had bank fraud happen to her and was pushed away and told to walk home. She was in her 90s and an NCO officer was at home with his kids and got a call from a community leader and helped to resolve that issue. So I want to give credit to the 105th precinct and all the precincts in my district and the NCO officers who really do, do go out their, uh, their way to work. And that was a sign of commitment. I think his name was Officer Roberts, so I want to commend him. I give them all of the credit for taking the initiative and getting the job done. And that might not seem like police work to some people, but it absolutely is. They took proactive steps to eliminate an unsafe situation and my community is better for it. If more people could see the NCOs in my district in action, I think they would really appreciate a lot more about how much the police department does. The questions that I do have are really about the definition of neighborhood policing. When I look at the NYPD webpage describing the NCO program, I see videos that are really about crime investigation and arresting suspects. If you look right now at neighborhood policing hashtag, hashtag neighborhood policing, many of the posts are exactly what I want to see. For example, there is a wonderful story about two NCOs changing their working hours so that they can be at their local mosque at the end of prayers and make sure everyone gets home safe at, at their local mosque in the neighborhood. That is fantastic. But others are about counterfeit good, goods bust and interviewing witnesses and gathering evidence. That's all fine, but is it what we want our NCOs doing? I also recall seeing a video from the summer of one NCO who responds to a noise complaint and ends up using a chokehold and eventually a taser when there really was no need to even make an arrest. De-escalation is the word. That concerns me. Those kinds of officers should not be NCOs, and those kinds of tactics should not be associated with a program that's supposed to be about building trust. I'm keeping an open mind here, and once again, I do support everything I've heard from the police department in terms of the NCO program. But I just want to make sure we're not putting a new name on the same tactics. I'm looking forward to hearing how that's not the case. So that being said, thank you for being here. Any other colleagues join us?
uh, Councilmember Rodriguez joined us, and uh, now we will hear from the uh, first panel, and uh, which is Chief Harrison and uh, Executive Director Oleg. I don't know why I needed to read your name. All right. <laughs> you may begin. <laughs> do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and answer all questions to the best of your ability? Yes. I do. <clears throat> so good afternoon, Chair Richards and the members of the uh, council. I am Chief Rodney Harrison, Chief of Patrol of the New York City Police Department. I am joined here today with Oleg Chinovsky. I'm not sure if I messed that up or not. The Department Executive Director of Legislation Affairs. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, we are pleased to testify before your committee about neighborhood policing. We first began as a pilot in the spring of 2015 in the, th in the 33rd, 34th, which is in Washington Heights, 100 and 101, which is in the Rockways precincts. It's today our guiding philosophy implemented in every precinct and housing, police service area, and six transit bureau districts with the remaining six districts scheduled to come online by the end of 2019. In addition, this year, the School Safety Division began a pilot that integrates the neighborhood policing into our schools through our newly created school coordination agents. To be clear, neighborhood policing is more than shaking hands and engaging neighborhood residents in friendly conversation. It is a comprehensive crime-fighting strategy built on improved communication and collaboration between police and the communities we serve, aimed at reducing crime, promoting safety, mutual respect, and solving problems collaboratively, with the recognition that enforcement is not always the answer. Neighborhood policing divides precincts into geographical areas called sectors, which corresponds to neighborhood boundaries and staffs them with officers who patrol almost exclusively within their assigned sector. There are generally about four or five sectors in each precinct. By working daily in the same sector, sector cops become intimately familiar with residents and business owners, as well as unique conditions in each such area. But more importantly, and what makes neighborhood policing different from prior attempts at community engagement or community policing is the engaging the community is at the core of an officer's duties. Unlike ever before, our staffing plan ensures that set the cops are not spending their entire tour listening to the radio and running from one 911 job to the next. Instead, we ensure that a third of the officer's tour is spent off the radio, meaning at least a third of each tour is spent engaging the community, problem solving, building trust, and improving quality of life in this city through a holistic approach to policing. Key to the success of neighborhood policing is the neighborhood coordination officer. We call them the NCOs. Each sector team includes two officers designated as NCOs. While applying to be an NCO is voluntary, those applying must demonstrate that they are not only stellar crime fighters, but also that they possess the skills and the temperament necessary to promote ongoing collaboration and engagement with communities. Officers that demonstrate such characteristics are handpicked by the commanding officers to be NCOs. Structurally, NCOs report to the NCO sergeants who in turn reports directly to the commanding officer. The NCOs serve as liaisons between the police and the community and also as key crime fighters and problem solvers in the sector. They spend time familiarizing themselves with the community to better respond to neighborhood specific crimes and conditions. The NCOs attend community meetings with the neighborhood residents, leaders, and clergy, visit schools, and follow up on incidents occurring within their sector. As a part of their community outreach function, NCOs run build the block meetings. These public forums are designed as working strategy sessions with community members who raise issues, problems, and complaints, and collaborate with the police in devising solutions. NCOs receive specialized training focused on providing them with a variety of skills they can employ in their work. As part of this initial transition to becoming an NCO, officers receive four weeks of training. 
This includes a five-day NCO-specific training course which covers topics such as community relations, public speaking, domestic violence and child abuse, interagency and interdepartment collaboration, crime prevention, and intelligence gathering. They then attend a four-day course on mediation and conflict resolution offered by the New York Peace Institute and a two-week criminal investigation court course that all detectives are required to complete. Because NCOs receive the same criminal investigation training as detectives, they are able to function as adjuncts to the precinct detective squads, responding swiftly to incidents and developing leads and gathering evidence that may have been lost or contaminated under the old model of specialized units and officers solely devoted to responding to radio calls. Recently, all NCOs received two days of training that focused specifically on outreach to the homeless population in New York. This broad spectrum of training enables NCOs to use creative approaches, techniques, and adaptive skills to solve problems both collaboratively with residents and via the use of resources within the outside, the NYPD, to address issues in the communities where they serve. As you may have noticed, neighborhood policing is a bottom-up approach where day-to-day -day community engagement and problem solving is led by officers, not supervisors. While it is true that neighborhood policing builds trust between communities and police, it is likewise true that neighborhood policing cannot work unless we, as department executives, trust our officers. That is why we have committed to providing our officers with the training, technology, and tools they need to successfully perform their duties and affording them the latitude to make decisions and solve problems. Their success is not measured by the number of summonses or arrests they make, but rather by the impact their performance has on making New York City residents lives better and our city safer. The ideas behind neighborhood policing are universal and apply to, to any area of policing where community interaction is vital. Some may wonder how we apply the principles of neighborhood policing to something as literally transient as a subway system. But transit cops see the same faces every morning and evening and build the same kind of relationships with citizens underground as their precinct counterparts do above ground. We see the, we see the benefits of neighborhood policing every day. Last January, an off-duty NCO in the 52nd Precinct received a tip from a local landlord on his department-issued cell phone. A tenant in his building had been assaulted but was too afraid to come forward. The NCO and the other 52nd Precinct NCOs responded and were able to interview the victim leading to the arrest of a violent sexual predator. Last February, NCOs and the field intelligence officers in the 9th Precinct worked together to break up a drug ring after a concerned community member attended a community member and a community meeting, excuse me, and told them about drug sales on his blocks. These are the very types of community relationships and partnerships that we strive to build and are the foundation of neighborhood policing. But our success is not just limited to crime fighting. In the 23rd Precinct, NCOs received a report of a vacant lot next to a school that was littered with discarded hypodermic needles. NCOs working with the school safety division and the parks department ensured that the lot was cleaned up and the school children were taken out of harm's way. I can spend the next several hours pointing to examples similar to the ones I just described, which demonstrates the effectiveness of neighborhood policing, and I can relay, re relay the numerous conversations I have had with both officers and community members alike who recount the ways neighborhood policing has changed neighborhoods for the better. However, anecdotal evidence only goes so far, and the NYPD is an organization that is committed to using proven strategies that work to drive down crime and increase trust and respect. To that end, the NYPD has commissioned a study to be performed by a respective outside research firm to tell us whether neighborhood policing reduces crime, increases respect, and trust between police and the community and improves collaborative problem solving. 
This two-year assessment will be objective, rigorous, credible, and most importantly, independent. We look forward to sharing those results with you as they become available. As Commissioner O'Neill has repeatedly said, neighborhood policing is not merely a program or initiative. It is not just a few cops in some parts of the city trying to be nice to their people. It is an overarching philosophy intended to reshape our approach to fulfilling our core mission. Neighborhood policing reflects a cultural change for the whole department, for every cop, every civilian employee, every bureau, division, and unit, and for everyone who lives, works, and enjoys New York City. It is about each of us sharing responsibility for public safety by working together. Thank you for inviting us to testify today, and we are now happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, we're also joined by Councilmember Gibson. So I'd just like to take a few minutes to get an update on a couple of troubling events that have happened over the last few days. Um, so let me start off with, uh, is the NYPD investigating the incident where the woman uh, given birth in the Bronx was kept in handcuffs while going into labor back in February? That uh, case is uh, still under investigation. Uh, I'm, I'm unfortunately gonna have to get back to you regarding that, Mr. Chair. Okay, and then I know, uh, I know this is against state law, but I wanted to hear the NYPD's protocol for cases like this. So if Oleg, if you could go into that. If, if you can, uh, I apologize. Um, that particular case is the subject of ongoing litigation. So if uh, we can, we'll share the patrol guide procedure with you after the hearing, uh, but we'd uh, refrain from commenting at this okay. time. But you do agree it's against state law? We'll, we'll provide the, uh, the procedure to you. Okay. Uh, and um, is there an investigation into the conduct of the officers involved in the incident where a mother's child uh, was ripped from her arms at the SNAP office uh, this past weekend? There, there is an investigation uh, ongoing at this time. It's uh, still in its preliminary phases, but uh, we will uh, get back to you regarding the results of the, the investigation. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring that up is considering the topic we're speaking on today on the neighborhood coordinating officers um, whose approach is primarily to be problem solvers as opposed to the, using the traditional approach of force and manpower. Um, you know, I would have hoped that NCOs would have responded to an incident um, like this. Uh, were any of these officers NCOs? No, they were um, uh, officers assigned to the 84th Precinct, but they were assigned as response autos. Okay. And um, so in a case like that, I mean, I, I would have hoped that NCOs would have responded to an, an incident like this. Uh, would you agree? And I'm just interested in hearing... Um, a little bit more on, on, I guess, the coordination between city agencies. So in a case like that, um, it would have been great if the NCOs obviously had a relationship with that particular um, office and they would have got the call. So that gets into the question around outreach and metrics and how do we measure the success of this program. Um, but I'm at least happy to know that they weren't NCO officers who, you know, would be charged with knowing the neighborhood a little bit more. So we look forward to hearing a little bit more about this um, following these investigations, but I think that this gets to the cusp of what we're doing today. Um, so let's speak about the NCO program for a second. How does the department make determinations of who is assigned uh, as an NCO? Mr. Chair, uh, the commanding officer will uh, put out a pretty much a job interview request for anybody that's looking to be a neighborhood coordination officer. So it's, uh, it's a voluntary uh, choice. Uh, anybody that uh, does uh, request to be a neighborhood coordination officer, uh, then the commanding officer will, will choose the individual that, that is the right fit. Uh, somebody that's hardworking, somebody that is uh, willing to put their best foot forward to work with the community that they're, that they're there to, to serve. Um, we want to make sure that the NCOs uh, are, are well-rounded. I, I use a phrase all the time, it's, it's the NCOs are utility cops. They, they can, uh, we want them to make sure that they're uh, solving problems within their uh, sector that they have ownership in. 
Uh, we want to make sure that they're building relationships, but we also want to make sure that they're taking care of uh, the conditions that are going on within this sector. So that NCO is a very, very valuable officer uh, to, to, a, to, a, to a localized precinct because they're the ones that uh, are intimate with the stakeholders within that area and they work uh, hand in hand with the residents to make sure they find a way to, to take care of any issues that come up within that sector. So can you just, so I heard you say it's, it's voluntary. Um, can you go into what the, so are there specific criteria that an inspector would look for, or a captain would look for to select these officers, or is this just, hey, I know this guy, he's, he's, a, he's been an old lady, uh, woman, uh, they, they're great people, so I think they'll make a, a great uh, NCO, or is there a specific criteria that the NYPD provides? Well, well first and foremost, we, they should have some time uh, within the police department. So we, we want our, our naval coordination officers to at least be on probation, you know, maybe have uh, preferably over two years uh, okay. within, the, within the department. Uh, we look for uh, an officer that has uh, previous good evaluations. Uh, so previous, say that again? That somebody has uh, good evaluations from, oh, good evaluation. from, from, okay. from prior years from, from their uh, frontline supervisors. Uh, we're looking for officers that are once again, are, are well-rounded. Uh, you know, are what does that mean, though? So uh, well-rounded. And, and one of the things that uh, that we take pride in is making sure we keep this this city safe. That's that's the most important thing within this police department. So uh, officers uh, have to be crime fighters first. We want the naval coordination officers to be able to uh, know how to to fight crime. So would you say that they've needed to exhibit uh, a certain number of arrests in the past not. or Absolutely. given out a certain amount of summonses, which I think you said is not necessary? Absolutely not. They um, just have to have a good work ethic regarding how to fight crime. And once again, this, there is not a, a number that we look, take a look at. Once again, these, these commanding officers are handpicking these officers. They know them very intimately. They speak to their, their supervisors to find out or what their work ethic is. So it's not just, hey, you know, this guy or girl gets me a good cup of coffee. You know, we find out a little bit more details about them. But there's no specific criteria set. No, there, there's no specific criteria that, that we've identified. Uh, when, once, once again, is they do have to have a, a certain amount of time on a job. Um, if they are on a promotion list, then more than likely we're probably not going to put them in that position because they may be leaving the position uh, sooner than later, and we want somebody that's going to be there for a, a certain period of time. Uh, yeah, the, the neighborhood coordination officer is a career path position. Uh, you know, it's something that uh, you after you become a neighborhood coordination officer, we we uh, give that officer an opportunity to go onto a investigative unit. You know, so it's. Uh, so I'm sure it's very appealing to those who are looking for that promotional path to the next level. Correct. Um, which does give me a little bit cause for concern because, you know, we had conversations around a pathway for individuals in the F as SVD unit, for instance, and it really wasn't much more of a path for, for those individuals um, in that particular unit. But uh, so what are the retention rates? So this is a very new program. Um, and I'm assuming since this is, it's a much more lucrative position to take, as you said, because it enables individuals to get to the next level, to, to move into an investigative unit. And as your testimony alluded to, um, they do get similar training to uh, detectives, right? Correct. They correct? get the uh, uh, criminal investigation course, which is a two-week training that every New York City detective gets. Uh, because we want our, our, our naval coordination officers to be investigated, we want them to be able to identify uh, a crime or a condition that's going on within their sector and work with their uh, ancillary investigative units to uh, be able to solve any uh, crime conditions that are, that are going on right. within their sector. And, and I guess just going back to that, so can you just define <laughs> how a community should view a neighborhood coordinating officer. And I know you have videos. I don't know if we could play that clip. But it sounds to me like they're doing it. So how much time is spent specifically on invest, investigatory work opposed to getting out there and learning who's in the neighborhood? And that gets me to the question of metrics. So how do you measure the 
success or successes that an NCO officer has in a sector. So there are certain, you know, I don't know if there's a bar of, of a particular amount of people they need to meet a month. How does the NYPD keep track of if NCOs in their sectors are building uh, relationships? And once again, I want to acknowledge that I think this program is a great program, but I, you know, unfortunately in my capacity, fortunately, have to also ask the hard questions as well. Um, so I, I'm all for it. I think the, the NCOs I know are doing a great job, but we're just interested in, in receiving a little bit more information on how this program works. All right. So if I could just uh, just give you a little bit of a, a quick uh, guidance regarding what the Naval Coordination Officers do on a daily basis. Uh, they're not necessarily assigned to a, a sector to answer 911 calls. That's where the steady sector mm -hmm. cars mm -hmm. uh, have that uh, assignment. Uh, once again, it's just the steady sector cars that are also a major part of neighborhood policing. We're asking them to take time off the radio, get out the car, and get to know the residents as well. That's, that's something that we've never done before. Historically in the past, those steady sector cars would go from one 911 job to another 911 job and uh, never get an opportunity to meet the stakeholders within the sector that they cover. The neighborhood coordination officers who are not on the radio, uh, they can find themselves during the day um, identifying a pattern uh, within their sector, just, and I'll just give an uh, example. People are breaking into a cars within their area of concern. Uh, they'll go out and, and look for video cameras, uh, videos that can kind of capture the incident. They'll speak to uh, maybe some witnesses that can help them identify who these individuals are who are committing these crimes. Uh, but also during the day, they'll find themselves uh, going to a senior citizen home and talk about crime prevention tips or going to the schools and talk about um, some of the uh, concerns that may go on with covering cyberbullying and things of that nature. So it's a, it's a self-motivated position. Um, the, uh, every precinct has one neighborhood coordination officer supervisor that oversees uh, all the NCOs. Uh, the average is eight NCOs per command. If it's a larger precinct, uh, you may find um, five sectors where they'll have 10 NCOs. Some of the smaller or not uh, so uh, large precincts may have uh, six sectors where they'll have, uh, excuse me, three sectors where they'll have six Naval Coordination Officers. So it'll, uh, you know, once again, as each precinct is, is different, uh, every NCO comes in with a, with a new assignment depending on what might have happened the day before, the week before, or things that may come across that table uh, during that day. Right, so that gets me to, um, so I, I know they have a supervisor. Uh, so are NCOs required to track interactions with the public? No, we don't, we don't uh, have them uh, prepare a weekly sheet to say how many times they've engaged in somebody. Do they have uh, something that we put in, the, in a, uh, an activity sheet where we, can say, hey, they, they did conduct a community visit or engaged uh, some types of business owners or going to a house of worship. Yeah, we do ask them to, to document it, but we don't, we don't take that information that's memorialized and then hold them accountable to say they're, they're successful at their, at their position. So you don't find that a problem that you don't track and there's no accountability? Um, and I wanna know what my staff is doing as a council member. Um, so I'm disinterested in knowing why the NYPD doesn't necessarily track to know that. And, and I, once again, NCO programs, a great idea, a noble idea. Um, but I am concerned without metrics and without knowing, and, and perhaps there are incidents that are happening across these communities, such as the ones we saw this weekend, where if there was, and I'm not saying, once again, NCOs are responsible in any form or fashion for what happened this weekend, but what I am saying is if perhaps we could have avoided, or we could avoid some incidents like this if there are metrics and we do know that we are pushing them to the greatest capacity to get to know. So it, it, what I'm getting at is it, it's very easy for NCOs to go to the same civic association meetings every month, and we applaud them for that. They just followed, we were at three uh, on last Thursday, and I thought it was great together. I mean, I felt like they were following me at one point, but it was, it was good. It was back to back to back. I'm like, wow, you guys again? <laughs> um, and I thought that that was good. But what I'm getting at is that can be considered an easy way out, being that 
civics meet once a month. It's not really hard to find or know. And I think it's good for Intel into addressing a lot of the quality of life issues in my civics, certainly appreciate it. But what I'm getting at is nine to three, whatever the tour is, 10 to three, whatever it is, how do we track metrics on knowing if they're actually reaching community members without real oversight? So I, I think if, if, I, if I could add a, a little bit, I, I think the greatest metric is the result, right? So to say that an officer went to 10 meetings or had 20 interactions and that somehow says, okay, they're keeping busy because they, they checked off 10 meetings, they checked off 20 interactions, and therefore this is a productive NCO. That really wouldn't be a good measure because those interactions or meetings may not be garnering any type of results. So I think- So the NCO's primary goal is to gather intel. Well, no, I think it's- I That's think what that's, it sounds like. Well, okay. no, no, not at all. I think, so I'll give you an example. I think it was in the 32nd precinct where there were 311 complaints. And that's one that I think certainly a metric that, that we would look at. Uh, there are 311 complaints and it was about a homeless individual in a park. And what the NCO did was approach that individual. That individual, of course, as you know, the, the department offers services. It's not illegal to be homeless. So we offer services to individuals living in the street and see if we can get them off the street and get them the help that they want. This individual routinely refused those services. The complaints, of course, would come in to 311. The individual wanted to stay in the street. It wasn't, unless it was for the uh, relationship that the NCO built with this individual, she voluntarily decided to check herself into the, to a facility and come off the street. So it's these types of successes. There are crime fighting success, uh, successes as well, I think, because and I, I don't think we've ever shied away from this. This isn't a position where your day-to-day -day function is shaking hands and greeting people. These are police officers, and they're expected to do police work. And in some respects, that entails enforcement, whether it be a summons or an arrest, whether it be taking guns off the street, whether it, whether it would be assisting uh, detectives, uh, for example, getting video, using the relationships that these NCOs build with the community members to possibly get a video, a surveillance video that may help solve a case of a violent crime. So yes, they're helping in the crime fighting aspect, but they're also uh, helping in the sense that there are quality of life 311 complaints coming in. And those complaints don't necessarily need to end with a summons or an arrest, where historically maybe that's the way they would have ended. So today we have, uh, whether it be the sector cops that are spending a third of their time off the radio, or whether it would be the NCO, would approach individuals, would, uh, would try to work through whatever that issue is, and try to stay away from enforcement, try to keep those individuals away from the criminal justice system. And to the extent they're able to resolve the issues in the community successfully without the use of a summons or arrest, that is deemed a success as well. So how do you measure what each sector is doing is the million dollar question. And it sounds like, yes, they are doing some detective work. Um, so the question is, you know, if we're calling them neighborhood coordinating officers, the way I'm reading with defining the program is they're supposed to be out learning the neighborhood, coordinating with the neighborhood, and of course they're still police officers and we don't, we won't shy away from that, but it's, to me, building bridges. So what's the difference between community affairs and what NCO officers do, if that's the case? Yeah. I, I just want to kind of go back to your question. And uh, regarding trying to capitalize or capture um, the successes or failures of, of a neighborhood coordination officer, uh, that falls on the ownership of, of the commanding officer who gets the information from their, their supervisor. We have to have trust in the, in, the, in the sergeants to say, hey, this neighborhood coordination officer is making relationships. He or she is solving problems. He or she is doing a great job regarding um, fighting crime. He or she is doing everything that they can regarding using uh, the different uh, city agencies to resolve problems. Um, and if they don't necessarily uh, 
uh, get on board with that philosophy, then, and I, I use this phrase, phrase all the time, we have a very deep bench, we'll get another NCO to fulfill that need. So, you know, we don't necessarily have to capture numbers to find out successes. You know, once again, this is just positive feedback or maybe even negative feedback if, if, if it warrants regarding uh, what the community thinks about that neighborhood coordination officer. Are they outreaching and addressing the problems within their sector? And that's the, 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 the ultimate goal of the, of the neighborhood coordination. I agree neighborhood. with that. So do you, how do you measure, because I just, um, I think we're having a firm difference in, and I guess this the way how we track the successes. I think we both agree that this program is necessary and it's an important step forward. Um, so sergeants, you said, would track this. Are they getting a detailed report? We've met this month 10 individuals, so you're saying they're not doing any of that. Well, I, if, if and, I and, and if not, the question is, how do we know in every place? So the 105, 101, like I said, I've acknowledged early that they do some great work, but how are we measuring if they're getting out there every day and meeting local stakeholders and local community members and how are they building the bridges? So I hear you on, I, we both agree that they should solve quality of life, but if you're an NCO and you're working this week, and you resolve one issue, that's a good thing, but the question is, could we do more? Could they do more? And my concern with not having metrics to measure that is we'll never know if they are reaching, who they are reaching, if they are really reaching the communities that they are put there to serve. Sure. And, sure. and so, so I'll allow you to respond. Yeah, to so that. I mean, yeah. other than the anecdotal metric, metrics that we know of, whether it be the success stories that we hear about, we also see 311 complaints coming in, and these are complaints. So if you see a 311 repeatedly coming into a particular command and it's not being addressed, right? So you see something's not, there's a disconnect there, something's not working. But aside from that. So right, you're I, saying you. Look at three one one. Well, I mean th that's that's so one that a piece. metric that you measure, and how would you measure whether an NCO? Well, but the, the, okay. if I if I so mm -hmm. that's one piece. Another piece could be, you know, so the NCO coordinates not only different units within the department, but also different agencies. Uh, okay, and coordinates with the community as well. So to the extent that a crime happens and the NCO is being, uh, is assisting detective bureau, right? That's another thing. So these are all, uh, there's anecdotal, there's uh, certain metrics that we use that we can track whether, whether uh, the NCO or the sector cops are, are performing adequately. But the other pieces, and I, I, we men the chief mentioned this in his testimony, I think it's worth repeating is, uh, the NYPD commissioned an independent um, company to review, uh, to actually look at metrics that could be used to actually formally review neighborhood policing in our impl implementation. Who's the company? Uh, RAND. So what the RAND group? Uh, okay. Is it group or corporation? Yeah, corporation. Uh, yeah okay. I, don't hold me to that. So um, what they're going to be doing, it's a two-year study that's going to be done, I believe, in five phases. I think the first phase is going to be complete uh, around June of 2019, and we'll, of course, look forward to sharing. And what results. are they specifically looking for? Well, they're going to be looking for how to measure success. So you right. agree with me that we should measure? Well, I, I, I think we. I think, <laughs> uh, I think one thing that I think you would agree with is that the police department always agrees that we need to measure success, right? We don't just walk out into the world and. Uh, kind of walk haplessly about. So uh, we we want we want to see uh, what the community is feeling about. So uh, this is the survey. Sorry to cut you off. Is this the survey that the public can take, or is this? No, that's that that's something separate. Okay. Uh, I think that was the sentiment meter. Um, and uh, but this is uh, commissioning a, an independent corporation that's quite respected, I think. To, um, to take a look at our implementation of neighborhood policing and to see how do we gauge success other than the how factors that we're doing. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be identifying uh, whether it's some of the factors that we're looking at now, whether it's other factors, they're gonna be trying to obviously make correlations and I think as, as the results 
come in, and it's a five-phase uh, study that's going to be done over a couple of years. But as the results come in, I think the first results around June of next year, we're going to be happy to share that with you. And how much does this study cost? Uh, we'll have to look into that for okay, you. If you can get that yep. back to us. Um, and and I, I would hope and uh, that some of the things I'm mentioning would be uh, part of that study and um, a real push to ensure that metrics are attached to the program. That I don't think it's that hard to mark down, just as we have a council program here called Council Stat, where we input constituent cases and we track how they resolved and all of those good things. I don't think it's that difficult for the NYPD and for officers to be able to, to do that. And then um, I'm going to get to my colleagues because they have questions and then I'll come back for a second round. Um, are the numbers on the calls, or e so they obviously they have cell phones. Do they track, how, do you track how many calls come in um, to specific NCO officers? Um, and emails, and are we measuring that as a way to estimate the connection to uh, local communities? All right, so, so Mr. Chair, and I, I just want to go back for, for just for one quick second, if you don't mind. The one thing we, we don't want to do with the Naval Coordination Officers is tie them down administratively. Uh, we want to make sure that they're getting an opportunity to get out there to, to do their job, mm -hmm. to get out there to meet people, to solve mm -hmm. problems, and uh, you know, that was the, the problem with the, our old philosophy, which was CPOP, you know, where the officers had to fill out beat books and a host mm -hmm. of other things, mm -hmm. and they found themselves inside doing administrative stuff instead of outside doing their job, which is why it kind of fizzled out. That's, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's the one thing I just wanted to make sure that that's very clear. We want to make sure that the NCOs are not being tied down uh, administratively. And I apologize, the second question that you had was, no, I, and just getting back to that, I don't think, and they, they carry cell phones, correct? They carry cell phones. And they're, I'm sure there's an app or something that Rand, I'm sure since they're doing a study, could recommend. I mean, I'm not a rocket scientist, but where they could put, you know, I met Shirlene Gray. I'm, so, I'm just so, throwing that name out. And she had a garbage issue, and I connected her to correct. sanitation. So would you find that to be administratively Difficult no, to do? No, and okay. the, we actually do have that. We have okay. a, a craft system where uh, the every officer can uh, put down uh, the things that they've accomplished throughout the day. Okay. And the frontline supervisors are allowed to go on this officer's craft and, and say, sign off and say, mm -hmm. yes, that officer did uh, take care of that complaint from Mrs. Jones, or mm -hmm. they were able to find um, video that uh, kind of helped. Uh, uh, give information regarding a, a recent incident, be it a shooting incident or something of that nature. So, yeah. The, the, but that would be considered a metric. Correct. Right. Correct. So, so we, we, we do have something in place where they can memorialize right. things that they do. Now, do we take that and count it all in, in, a, in a whole? No, no we, we, we don't. Would you, do you think that's too difficult to do once again? I think just taking a simple report and every NCO is not equal. I'm sure there are some NCOs who, like I think uh, NCO Roberts and the 105th, who go above and beyond the call of duty, and I think that's the goal of the program, is these officers are supposed to exemplify going above and beyond the call of duty, not being looked at as enforcement necessarily, although they're doing work, but they're supposed to be looked at as community builders, people who b are building bridges between the community uh, and the NYPD. And um, my concern without having metrics to measure that is that you may just have individuals sitting and looking voluntarily, quote unquote, to become NCOs because there's a promotional path um, there. So we'll go there, we'll serve out some time. We got track the, uh, tra uh, training to become a detective, you know, uh, and that counts towards something. Um, so I, I think that's where we may differ, once again, to support the overall goals, but I think we can imagine what we could do if we actually know that every NCO out there in every sector is going above and beyond the call of duty of meeting community members. Not to say they're not, but as we know, this is a department. How, how many officers are in the NCO program total? Uh, we have 960 Naval Coordination Officers. So 960, which is great, right? Um, 
out of those 960, I'm sure there are some who go above and beyond the call of duty, just as in any um, agency or department. And then you may have some who may just be doing time to get the next promotion. You may have some that are doing good work, some who are doing bad work. And I think my concern overall is that there's no system that measures. Um, so I would hope that we get there. Just retention rates to an NTO program so far? Do yeah, we have so I numbers? have that information. By the way, uh, let me redact my last statement. 785 Naval Coordination Officers, 610 of them are male, 175 of them are, are female. So uh, once again, we have neighborhood policing in 76 out of the 77 precincts. So one precinct doesn't have it in Central Park, which I'm sure you can understand the, 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 the reason for, for that. Uh, I don't it, understand the reason. Well, uh, it's, it's not a necessarily a residential uh, precinct, okay. so that's why it's okay. more geared to or, towards identifying residents and working hand in hand with okay. them. Okay. Mr. Chair, I, I just have to uh, clean up one thing here, and I, I think there may be a little bit of a misunderstanding. The neighborhood coordination officers are crime fighters first. Okay. Their main job is to make sure that they keep the residents in their sector mm -hmm. safe. Um, in that same process, we want to make sure that they build relationships uh, with the communities that they're there to serve, that the ones that they're there to protect, to, to make sure that they can uh, uh, have a sustainable relationship just in case if anything in the future comes up, they, they work together to, uh, to correct it. So that's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'm hearing uh, quite often uh, that they're community friendly and, and that's one of their goals. But they, they wouldn't get that position if they're not crime fighters first. Right. But your commercial shows these amazing individuals who walk up and down the street, Correct. who throw basketballs with kids, and, and, that, and I think that's noble. We're trying to change and shift the public's view of the NYPD, and that's, I think that's a great part of the program. Um, but my only concern is that if they're going to be viewed as crime fighters within the department, I think that the messaging are they crime fighters, which they are, no doubt, but there's, you know, one thing you're promoting and then, and then you know, we here obviously know or in the know, but um, just wanted to put that out there. You didn't answer the question on retention rates so far within the NTA Yes, so um, to date in Patrol Service Bureau, 96 officers and 13 sergeants have left their positions as uh, Naval Coordination Officers. How many? Uh, 96 officers okay. and 13 sergeants. Uh, once again, it's for, for various amount of reasons. 11 officers and one sergeant have been transferred to investigative units. Remember, I was talking about the, mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. career paths. Uh, 20 officers and four sergeants left to left their commands to go to other other units. You know, once again, is uh, mm -hmm. the one thing about this organization I love. We have uh, tons of units uh, throughout the uh, throughout the agency. Uh, nine officers and three sergeants were promoted to the next supervisory rank. Mm -hmm. uh, 35 officers and five sergeants were transferred to other positions within the precinct, not for performance issues, and 21 officers and no sergeants were transferred to other positions in the precincts for performance issues. 21 were transferred out before performance yes. issues? Yes, sir. Okay. And I think, just before I turn it over, um, that was an important question for several reasons. You know, building relationships with the community, and, and that's why I wanted to hear what's the difference between them in community affairs, right? Because if this specifically is starting to be viewed as a promotional path, you lose that community connection, right? So Officer Roberts got to know the local bodega owner, and in less than a year, he's promoted and someone is filling that gap. So the trust that was built in over time uh, then is lost and you're starting over again, right? So once again, I get what you're saying. It's supposed to be crime fighters, but the worst thing we could do is promote these officers as people who are going to be the, reg the regulars in our neighborhood, who we get to know, who we build trust and love with. Similar to my inspector and in the inspectors in the 101. We always get some great inspectors in the 101, and then the numbers go down, and it looks great, and then they're promoted out, and the community is just like again again, again, after they, they've built so much trust over time. And this is not, I'm not saying we want people to stay where they're at, but for this program to be two years old to a great degree and just coming into some local precincts um, now um, and to see people starting to already move out of 
place, move out of the neighborhood already after they might have built trust in over time. So there should probably be some metrics. I would be interested in looking um, for a minimum amount of time, perhaps. I don't know if I'm speaking out of sort for individuals to serve in this capacity before they're promoted, right? So maybe it's a four-year minimum. I don't know if that's there yet, but it shouldn't be a two-week minimum or a, or one-year minimum especially when there are individuals who probably are waiting another unit to, I'm sure, have been waiting for a promotional pass for 10 years or more, um, so, which we do hear sometimes too. But, but I'm going to leave that alone for today. Um, Mr. But Chair, if, I, if I could just uh, answer your question regarding the difference between the community affairs officer mm -hmm. and the neighborhood coordination officer. The community affairs officer is, is pretty much the um, – extension of the commanding officer regarding community concerns. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not necessarily into the crime fighting mode. Mm -hmm. They're there to uh, identify any community needs and address it, and, and that's a whole, the, the precinct as a whole. In contrast to the neighborhood coordination officer, uh, they're assigned exclusively to a localized precinct. Mm -hmm. they're, they're there, and once again, is this, and I'll just use a 105, whatever's going on in one sector, let's just say A as in, as in, in uh, Adam, may be totally different from concerns that may be going on in sector D as in David. And 105 is a very big precinct, and the communities and the, and the cultural change. So um, that NCO is very, very valuable to, the, to the, having the uh, utmost knowledge what's going on with, within the area that they cover. And that's why we put them there on a day-to-day on -day I'm going to stop you, though, because community affairs probably knows more than what an NCO would ever know in a community. I'm just saying, mm -hmm. Chavota Cooper, Kevin Campbell, these are fixtures in our local communities. Pat McCabe, you know, like these are individuals who are fixtures who probably can get more information than an NCO on any day because they've built up that trust mm -hmm. for years. So, the, so I guess what I'm getting at is, is would it have made sense to expand that program and roll out great commercials and reshuffle it, change the name or whatever you wanted to do rather than creating a whole new program, NCOs, which would primarily be focused, you know, on crime fighting, as you said, because community affairs officers, everything you promote on that commercial is what the community views as community affairs officers. They've been doing it in, in the trenches for a long time. So listen, I'm not here to knock it. Once again, I think the NCO program is good, but I just think, you know, we need to define and ensure that the public knows exactly what they're doing. But I would argue that community affairs officers, yes, they looked at from uh, the aspect of doing very little enforcement, they're trusted. Um, they probably can get information about, which they do, and I know, I, I mean, I know that for a fact, even beyond being a council member, my work in relationships with them. So would it have made sense to just roll this or put more money into that, expand it, so that then you really get that community affairs nexus um, a part of it. But uh, I'm going to go to my colleagues for questions because I've, I've gone on for a long time. I'll come back around. Um, and I want to acknowledge Council Members Brandon, Deutsch, uh, Cohen, and Menchaca. But once again, let me just say I support the department's goal um, of this program. I, I think that it has done some good but I just think that we need to have a clearer definition of what they are actually supposed to do um, and ensure that if their job is to build that trust that these officers are fixtures in the community and actually that there are metrics that ensure that we know that they're actually doing the job that they're set out to do. So once again, I applaud the NYPD on this. Um, but we, you know, we need to, I think, define metrics a little bit. I think we could, and we, and do, by doing that, I think we will build even more trust, right? So I will go to Gibson, followed by Gibson, Deutsch, Menchaca, and then Cohen. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon, Chief. Good afternoon, Oleg. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming today. And uh, a really important topic to talk about, about the NCO program. Um, I certainly know a lot about it, and I remember the launch in the spring of 2015. And I really appreciate the efforts and understand that this is really going to be a fundamental hallmark of the administration of how we get back to the neighborhood-based policing 
And I think in 2015, when it first rolled out, you know, a lot of New Yorkers didn't really understand what the overall goal was. Um, you know, many of them knew the beat cops, the cops that they knew on the street by name, they knew them and their children. And I honestly can say that it's been three years now, and I'm grateful that it's in every command. Um, one of the first rollouts, in initi initially the four commands when you came to the Bronx. Um, and I've seen you at almost every rollout, so I appreciate the effort and certainly the consistency. Um, I think the NCO program for me is about consistency. And the community affairs offices we have are great, but the NCO program is really different from community affairs. And I think residents and stakeholders are, are now starting to understand that. Um, so looking at the NCO program and moving forward, um, three years are under the, our belt. Where would you say the NCO program is going to go moving beyond? So we have another three years under this administration. Um, we are constantly looking at ways to reinvent the wheel, uh, be innovative, be creative in our approach. Um, I have seen many of the safety summits now called Build the Blocks. Um, I'm going to go on record and say that I have two of the very best NCOs in the Bronx in the 4-2 precinct. When they started their Build the Block meetings, they had three and 400 people that attended their first several meetings. And over the several months, you know, it started to get much more intimate. So it was focused on clergy, it was focused on young people, we focused on schools, and I really saw a lot of different people, right? Because I think at the very beginning, we expected to see the same residents to go to community board meetings and precinct council. And that's not necessarily the audience that we want to always see. We want new people that don't always come out to meetings, the parents that don't necessarily come out. And what I've seen is that happen through the years. And now that it's in all of my precincts, it's in my PSA, I'm grateful to see where it's going, but I want to understand from the department's perspective, where do you see the NCO program as it continues to move forward? So good afternoon, um, Ms. Council. So the, one of the things that um, I, I like about the neighborhood policing uh, philosophy is uh, we're expanding it. Uh, so we have uh, nine uh, police service areas that also have neighborhood mm -hmm. policing uh, in right. it. Uh, now we're pushing it out to the transit districts. We have 12 transit districts within the city. Right now it's in six of them and we plan on having it in the other six by the end of uh, 2019, which I think is gonna be very, very valuable to those who commute through the transit system. And as well as we now have taken it to the next level and are going to have neighborhood uh, policing mm -hmm. in school safety agents. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to help uh, that level of intimacy within the uh, the Board of Ed, which is going to help build relationships and have a little bit of a of a of a stronger uh, understanding regarding uh, our relationships with the kids that we that we're there to uh, protect and serve. In addition, a lot of the NCOs, as you mentioned, deal with quality of life issues, um, but the number one goal is they are still fighting crime. For NCO officers, for new officers joining the NCO program, there is always a challenge of finding a very common balance. It's a very sensitive you know, circumstance when you're building relationships, but you also need information as well from residents. And you have to take time to build the relationships, deal with quality of life issues, but also understand that it's about making sure that we deal with the larger issues around violence and domestic incidents. So from your perspective, how do you think the NCO officers are instructed in giving a lot of guidance guidelines on how to find a balance of crime fighting, building relationships, and dealing with quality of life all at the same time. So that's the whole concept of neighborhood policing is that we want the, the officers assigned to that certain area, the NCOs, as well as the steady sectors, to get to know the residents prior to that incident occurring. So if that unfortunate incident does occur, we don't have to worry about their relationship building upon that incident occurring. And that's the one thing uh, that, that people are not uh, taking into consideration the importance of uh, building relationships, working together, uh, having that, um, that ownership within a, within a localized area. And then if something does occur, the, the neighborhood coordination officers know how to 
work with the different uh, people within that, res that residence, the stakeholders, to identify that issue and uh, come to some type of resolution. Okay. So the chair talked a lot about metrics and measurements and how you define success. Um, how often do you engage with the NCOs and the NCO sergeants to get feedback from the NCOs directly in terms of how are they feeling, any challenges, improvements, et cetera? So out of my office, we have a, a team of supervisors that go to the different precincts, uh, have focus groups with the sergeants as well as the, the naval coordination officers to identify, you know, what are the issues? What, what, what logistically do you need? What little nuances that you seem to have struggles with? And we get great feedback, and uh, some of these NCOs have uh, uh, some of the best antidotes to, to make neighborhood policing better, and we take this information and we implement it, not just within their precinct, but maybe citywide. So the, the one thing that we always do is constantly, constantly try to uh, see what the, the cops are saying about neighborhood police and some of the great success stories that they see, some of the uphill battles that they have to climb and how can we make their jobs much easier going forward. Okay, and I'd also like to understand as well, because I know many of my NCO offices very well and my constituents do reach out to them a lot, um, the coordination of city services. So NCO officers are you know, tasked with the responsibility of really making sure that they can serve as almost a, a liaison between the resident and a local agency. So accessing resources. My grandson you know, wants to apply for summer youth or needs a job or needs to get into a program, an educational vocation program. So a lot of NCO officers, and to me that's not necessarily quality of life, but it's certainly about their quality of life, that resident and their family. So in terms of resources, a resource guide, when we first launched the NCO program, um, Deputy Commissioner Susan Herman, I remember seeing it, but there was an actual booklet that we published in Washington Heights that had all of the resources in different agencies and CBOs and clergy and faith-based organizations that the NCOs were given in the 3-3 and the 3-4 to provide information to the residents. So are we still doing that in terms of those resource guides, is that still happening? Uh, absolutely. Uh, okay. First and foremost, the Naval Coordination Officers, before they uh, take the position, they have to get a certain type, certain type of training, one of them being the, like I stated before, the criminal investigation course, which uh, all the New York City detectives uh, have to get. They also have to get uh, a mediation uh, training. It's a three-day training, which is done by the Peace Institute, uh, which is an external group which uh, helps us mediate uh, incidents that may come across their table. But that NCO training is one of the most important training because it teaches the Naval Coordination Officers how to work with the different city agencies and how to solve problems that are going on within their localized sector. So they're also uh, armed with this book just in case if uh, there is a agency that they need to get in contact, be it sanitation, department of traffic, uh, uh, whoever it may be, uh, they, they're armed with this book so they can make the appropriate uh, contact to address uh, any problems that come up. Okay, and my last question, uh, my other colleagues have questions as well, is the rollout in transit. So it's a little different, um, a little unconventional of having the NCO program in transit. So um, you're working with Chief Delatory. How is that going to work? You're already in six transit districts. Um, Mine is Transit District 11, uh, which will be rolled out next year. But how would that work and how would that be separate from the community affairs offices that we already have in transit districts? Uh, Madam Chair, what are, if you don't mind, I'm gonna have uh, one of the inspectors from transit come up and oh, talk sure. about that, please. I thought you were from school safety. <laughs> we have school safety here Thank as you. well. Thank you. Son? Yes, uh, good afternoon. So, Can you just uh, identify like the yourself? I'm sorry, uh, Inspector Raymond Porteous. I'm the commanding officer of the Special Operations District for the Transit Bureau. Okay. I was formerly involved with the uh, Lieutenant Trainer involving uh, Chief Delatorre when he tasked us to create the neighborhood policing model to work in transit. So I'll just give you a little bit okay. of background. As the Chief mentioned, we're in um, six districts, uh, 3, 4, 12, 20, 30, and 32. And we, as um, the Chief also testified, we're going to be rolling out uh, by the end of next year uh, districts 1, 2, 33, 11, which uh, is your district, mm -hmm. uh, 34, and 23. 
Okay. So a lot of the, you know, the same um, concepts and philosophy and paradigms that w we have in transit, we took from the PSP model, we kind of modeled it after that. One of the things, the onset was um, how are we gonna make the neighborhood policing work in transit? Um, you know, because we don't really, have, do we have a community? Yes, we do. The commuters are our community. So we want to tap into them. Like Oleg mentioned earlier, you know, the same people are going to and from the train station each day. And then our task uh, was the challenge is, you know, how do we engage those folks to find out what the problems are? You know, ordinarily people don't want to stop. You know, when I go to and from work, to and from school, and so forth. So that was the challenge that we, we gave the NCOs. And uh, part of the, um, uh, the uh, Councilman uh, Donovan asked, um, you know, how do we choose our NCOs? Well, we choose them very carefully. Um, it's a interview process, like Chief Harrison mentioned. You know, we look at their evaluations. Uh, you know, the CO, CO has the most weight to uh, recommend an NCO. You know, he or she knows that person more intimately than anybody else. That being said, the next level is the, the borough level, where the inspector or deputy inspector would interview that NCO as well, and then they get rubber stamped and get sent up to the bureau level. Uh, Chief Delatore wanted us to personally interview uh, the NCOs, so we formed a committee, myself, Lieutenant Trainer, so many of the executives at the Transit Bureau, and we interview them. And one of my questions I had was, um, you know, how it, how, you know, we have a lot of young officers, so how are these young officers gonna engage the, the ridership, how are they gonna engage the MTA workers? You know, they gotta be able to marshal up the, uh, the resources and address concerns. So that being said, one of our questions with them, especially the younger officers, how are you, you know, as a five-year officer or a three-year officer going to uh, grab a 15-year officer and tackle problems in the subway? And most of our problems, you know, whether it's uh, crime, uh, we have some crime issues, grand lawsuits and so forth, but a lot of the problems the communities, communities complain about is quality of life, quality of life, homeless, quality of life, you know, people uh, selling stuff on trains, break dancing, um, jamming the machines, theft of service, all those things. So we tasked the NCOs, we're coming up with some ideas, how are you gonna get, A, engage the public? You know, how do you gonna get them? So one of the ideas that came up was to give them, uh, you know, you'll see the signs in the subway, you know, with the pictures on them, the two NCOs and the, uh, the station manager, you know, give them email address, contact them, uh, they also give out cards for that. We also have a Twitter account the chief has that uh, complaints get funneled through, and also as well as the uh, MTA portal. The MTA uh, gets complaints all the time, and it filters down to us, which gets sent out to the NCOs to address. So part of it, you know, you talk about m metrics to measure stuff. One of the things that we look, look at and we test the, the NCO sergeants with doing is following up on these complaints, whether it be an email, email complaint from, um, from a commuter, from the MTA portal, Getting, getting those complaints in, and then what was the follow-up? And so, so we get complaints about homeless. So the NCOs then are tasked with marshaling up their resources, whether it's contacting the uh, uh, BRC, the Bowery Residence Committee, uh, contacting HOU, um, and getting them all together, and then bottom line is to try to get you know, those homeless people services. Okay, thank you very much. That was a, a very good summary, thank you. Um, I look forward to working with you uh, as we continue to expand the NCO program and Chief Harrison, I certainly wanna thank you on behalf of the Bronx. I know how much you love the Bronx, you're always there, um, but I really do appreciate the attention that's been given. This really is about a mindset change, a culture change, and really a shift of how we police in New York City, and so we constantly need to look at innovative approaches of how we can continue to improve rel relationships, keep crime at all time low, and make sure that at the end of the day people feel safe, but also that New Yorkers know they have to be a part of the process, and, and not, you know, not the problem, but be a part of the solution. So I thank you, Chair, for having today's a very important hearing, and looking forward to working with you. Thanks again. Thank you. And thank you, uh, former Chair Gibson, for that. I think what she said was on point. And I think one of the things we want to do is help you to tell the story of your success. But the only way for us to do that is to ensure that there are, there's something there. I want to go out there and talk more about it. I want to be able to say, you know, uh, NCO Roberts, man, he's on the job. He talked the, th I know for a fact he talked to 30 people today, or thir not today. Th I don't talk, well, some days 30, but, you know, he, help resolve 30 issues this week and these are the issues and chief harrison you would be the person that they ultimately i know the commissioner's up there you're the chief person they would speak to in regards to this program correct uh well i'm the one in overseas you control have, services bureau which has the, right. the most uh neighbor so all situations. the ncos are oh, all the you. ncos are, all right so are, i come are, to you and blame you of course okay 
All righty. So you're responsible. Got it. So in a situation like what we saw this weekend, once again, in a serious note, we would have rather the NCOs deal with this incident. And that's why I think tying the metrics to this is so important so that we know specifically, I'm not sure who's assigned to that sector, but that center should have known for a fact that, you know what, or, and, and there obviously was a breakdown in HR and we got questions on that too, so I don't wanna put it all on PD here on why they called the NYPD in the first place. But at the very least, I would have rather the center direct the call an NCO to come in to deal with a nonviolent issue, something that, you know, clearly was not an arrest offense sitting on the floor allegedly. So that's what I'm getting at. That's why I think it's important for us to ensure that there are metrics tied um, because then we can alleviate a lot of the nonviolent quality of life, something as minute as that for NCOs to deal with. So I'll go to Councilmember Deutsch now, followed by Deutsch, Menchaca, then Cohen. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, so this, uh, this uh, question is for the Chief. Um, uh, like we all concerned about the increase of hate crimes throughout the city, we had a 5% increase this year based, um, compared to last year and a 28% increase uh, targeted to, to Jewish uh, anti-Semitism uh, compared to 2017. Um, we had a very disturbing incident in Queens uh, just a few weeks ago with that individual, 16-year-old individual is still laying in a hospital bed. Uh, I believe two arrests were made. Can you please like, uh, explain if that is, if the hate crime is ruled out or it's still being investigated as a possible hate crime? And if you could please explain what happened in that case, whatever you can discuss that still, that you can about that incident in Queens. So uh, it's still under investigation. I don't know all of the little uh, details, Councilman. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask uh, if I could get back to you regarding uh, the, the exact details, but one thing I will say is uh, the New York City Police Department, we do not tolerate uh, biased crimes of that, of that nature. Uh, and it's not just a neighborhood policing uh, philosophy how to address it, it's all 36,000 police officers are engaging regarding to stop any types of uh, bias uh, acts that happen uh, throughout the city. But so regarding I, I, the details. I, understand. I, I, I just want to, um, there was a meeting in Queens where the NYPD showed up and after about a half hour they were told that they have to leave on the 112 precinct. It's not my jurisdiction. I'm the chair of the Jewish caucus and I'm very concerned about that. For two weeks I've been trying to find out um, what happened. Is it is still a possible hate crime? Um, someone ended up in a hospital with stitches and almost ended up in a coma. And two weeks later, I still, don't, I still can't get any answers to what the investigation is, um, what the NYPD is doing about that. And what disturbs me most is that we have, we have a tremendous increase in hate crimes across the city. And I, and I can't get answers of what happened in Queens and it's been already two weeks. So I had a meeting in Williamsburg just a week ago and in Crown Heights where the commanding officers came in. We had a discussion uh, and really it was a real, um, um, the dialogue was, was helpful and we were able to walk out of that meeting have, having a better understanding of how they will be better protect um, the residents of those communities. But in the case in Queens, um, I still, you know, like I said, it's been two weeks. I can't get answers. I tried getting a hold of your office. I couldn't get a response. And I just want to know when um, I could get a, uh, a briefing of what is, what is happening in Queens and if it's still on investigation as a hate crime. Because I think that in this day and age, with everything going on, we should have answers already. Yeah, uh, council member, as soon as uh, obviously we didn't come prepared to talk about that incident uh, today, given the topic of the hearing, but I can uh, assure you that once this hearing's over, I'll get a briefing 
on uh, the status of the investigation. I'll give you a call and reach out to you and, and uh, update you. And, and Councilman, if you don't mind, uh, after we saw a uh, uptake in some of the incidents that have been occurring throughout the city, we've uh, designated uh, house of worship autos uh, to each one of the 77 precincts, or 76 precincts, excuse me, uh, on each tour. And their job is to mainly focus is to go to the different houses of worships to somehow uh, stop any of these uh, attacks or incidents from, uh, from occurring. How do the NCO offices, um, uh, how do they, how do they put, how, how are they put in play with what's going on across the city? Uh, do they receive training on hate crimes? Um, are they part of the House of Worship patrols? Are they asked to go to House of Worships across the city? Well, well all officers uh, get training on, on hate crimes. That's the first and foremost. Uh, we do ask the NCOs to go to the, to the different uh, religious institutions and talk about uh, certain things that may be going on within their localized area, uh, things that uh, may not necessarily be out to the public. We make sure that the NCOs uh, arm uh, the different institutions with uh, the appropriate knowledge as well as the crime prevention, uh, be it uh, how to put a camera in a certain location or how to secure their uh, facility. Uh, but the NCOs are very involved with the crime prevention uh, when, especially when it comes to these, to these hate crimes. So the NCO offices give crime prevention uh, education? Absolutely. They do. And how does that work? Uh, well, they get training um, uh, throughout the, each NCO gets training from the training supervisors at the localized precincts, and they take this information. Once again, as I've always said, what may be happening in one precinct may be different from what's going on in another precinct. What's happening in one sector may be different from what's going on in a different sector. So. The, the NCOs are very much in tune to a lot of the different occurrences that are going on throughout the city. They take the information, they go to the different uh, organizations uh, within the sector to make sure that people know exactly what's going on and, and how to protect themselves. Uh -huh. Do you have, uh, do they have like a, a log, like which um, house of worships they did this um, education in? Could I, I could get a copy of that? I, I can't say that every precinct does have it. Uh, in, I, in my district, I have 606170. I, I could, I'm going to have to get back to you regarding Okay, uh, great. But I know that they do uh, m document their engagements uh, on reports that they, that they do prepare. On visits? On, on visits, yes, sir. Okay. Um, finally, I just want to ask one, uh, one other question. When um, people are encouraged to email or call NCO officer, so when an email goes into an NCO officer, does anyone monitor of when that email gets responded to, number one? And number two, when someone leaves a message with an NCO officer, because that's a, a police-issued phone, does anyone, mo anyone monitors when that person receives? Like, is there a log the NCO officer has to log in? I just received an email on this and this date. I returned the email on this and this date. Well, uh, one of the things that we ask our NCO sergeants to do is to make sure that the neighborhood coordination officers are getting back uh, vigilantly to the any complaints that come across via email, uh, anything that comes across their phone. Uh, and if it doesn't, we also encourage uh, the community to make sure that they let the NCO sergeant be aware of the I guess the, the slow response, uh, we'll, we'll say. Do they have to log it in? The NCO officers, do they need to log it in? There, there's not a, a necessarily a, a login process uh, regarding when they received a call and, and the time matter of, of how they got back to it. Uh, we do have the utmost trust in our neighbor coordination officers to take care of the, the issues that come up within the sector in a, in a timely manner. But that's a, a, a whole new way of, of a police, and we want to trust our cops. So, uh, so in the city council, we have what's called, um, we have a program that when a call does come into our office, it's called IQ, and we log in that call. Um, we don't have anyone watching over us except for the press, but we log in every single call that comes in, and then, uh, we, can, then we know that we have to respond within an appropriate time. So yes, we have to trust our offices, but um, just like just like we do in the city council, logging in the calls and knowing um, if you have to go back to a previous call three months later, you know what the issue was from that same caller. 
So, I mean, my recommendation is, is that they should be logged in, because I have found that when NCO offices were sent an email to them, when e emails were sent to them, they didn't get back for like a week and a half later. Um, and if they log it in, they know that there's accountability for them to return the call, because their job is basically just to be in their sector and to take care of the quality of life issues. Um, you know, I think there has to be some type of accountability that when they receive a call, it should be logged in what the call is about. This way, a supervisor could check that log. And the same thing with the emails. There should be a log of when the email came in and when they responded to that email. Uh, I think that's important for a, a way for a supervisor to, to have some type of oversight to make sure that they are returning the calls in a timely manner. Mr. Councilman, I'll take a look at that and, and maybe we could. All right, I have a lot more questions, but I'm going to save it for maybe the next hearing. But anyway, um, Oleg, I want to thank you very much for, I, I think I've been seeing you once a week. I want to thank you very much. We had issues with the uh, bollards uh, throughout the city um, with the um, Homeland Security funding that uh, people, that the organized not for profits received, and you've been a tremendous help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Going to go to Menchaca, followed by Menchaca Cohen. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the NYPD for being here. Uh, I want to say that uh, my my reports from the from the ground in the district are incredibly positive as well. Uh, though I will I will confront uh, Councilmember Gibson that I think our NCOs are just a lot better than than yours. Um, but. Beyond the positive, I want to kind of offer some opportunities for discussion about how to move through the evolution of the NCOs as I've seen them in the 7-2 and now the 7-6 and the rolling out of the 6-6 and the 6-8. Uh, one of the things that, that I was confronted with with uh, the new CEOs, NCOs was the ability to run a meeting with a community. The training that they have had uh, through the police academy made them crime fighters. Uh, maybe this is the kind of conversation that you were having earlier with the chair. But uh, one of the things that, that I offered, actually, and I want to follow up with, is, is training just how, how, to, how to run a community meeting. In Sunset Park, we have a pretty high immigrant community as well. And that creates a whole other new layer of need to understand how to, how to engage a multilingual discussion in a room. How to, if, we're, if you're fighting crimes, in our neighborhood, block by block, quadrant by quadrant, uh, being able to, to take information from multiple languages is important information as we move forward. Are you preparing, uh, and how can we work together to prepare NCOs for how to run a meeting in an immigrant community? So good afternoon, uh, Mr. Council. So uh, one of the trainings that I, I failed to uh, talk about was uh, each one of the Neighborhood coordination officer gets a uh, speak uh, speaking uh, present uh, speaking training where they're uh, brought down to one police plaza and Commissioner Herman, who chairs the meeting, uh, teaches the NCOs how to intake questions as well as be able to uh, get back to the community residents in in a timely manner uh, regarding the the concerns that come up in these bullet block meetings. Uh, these NCOs uh, don't have the, the public speaking uh, savvy like everybody else, so this training is very important to them because we want them to feel comfortable to stand up in front of people. And when does this happen? Does this happens uh, prior to them uh, becoming neighborhood coordination officers. So anybody who has uh, become a, a neighborhood coordination officer, be it through attrition or, or prior to a rollout, they are asked to come down and go through this training. And we go through a host of different scenarios, be it a, a combative uh, resident that has a frustration towards the police department. We teach them how to de-escalate that, that, that conversation. Uh, we give them uh, all the different uh, resources so they can explain to people how they're going to address any of the issues that come up, and as well as to make sure that they get back to that resident in, in a timely manner. Um, we want them to stand a, a certain direction to make sure they're not intimidating. Uh, we make sure that there is a language barrier, that they provide uh, some type of translation 
uh, prior to the meeting. And what resources do they have access to to provide that translation? Uh, we, we, we work with uh, either uh, other officers that in the precinct that can do the translation. They may have to go into the residence and get an individual to do the translation as well. We're also working with um, a lot of the elected officials who are very instrumental in getting a robust attendance to the uh, build the block meeting. So there's different strategies to make sure that anybody from any ethnicity that comes to this meeting, uh, the neighborhood clinician officers know how to make them feel comfortable within this meeting. Are you able to track this, uh, uh, the, the steps that officer NCOs are taking? How many times they're requesting for translation? How many times they're in a situation where there's multilingual meetings? Is that data that you're, that you're collecting right now in terms of NCO operations? I'm going to have to say no. That's something that we're, we're not doing at this time. Would you be open to, to doing that, being of able course. to? Yeah, OK. And I want to work with you. Uh, the work that I'm doing as part of the chair of immigration is really kind of thinking about all these little nooks and crannies that can really change the game for whatever operations on the ground. And, and I, can, I can say it's been, it's been somewhat effective in 7-2 uh, specifically. Uh, because a third of the population that we serve are, are Chinese, three different dialects, and Spanish. Yeah. And those are, the, those are the community members we're trying to engage as almost over 50% of the population yeah. in, in that neighborhood. Uh, w I think, well, maybe here's my, my over broad question. How can we work together to, to make things happen and change? Well, how, how would you propose that? Well, I, I think not just Manny Gonzalez in the 72 precinct, but all of our commanding officers have a great relationship with elected officials. And one of the things that we constantly promote is to make sure that the working relationship is helping to promote neighborhood policing. I mean, that's one of the things that we've asked all of our commanding officers to do to, once again, is to get people to know who their neighborhood clinician officer is, uh, be able to get that contact information out, because I think as great of a job as we're doing advertising neighborhood policing. Uh, my ultimate goal is to have every single resident of New York know that they have a cop assigned to them. And I think that's something that uh, was still a work in progress. It, it's getting out there, but um, just speaking to your local commanding officer and say, hey, listen, what can I do to be a little bit more part of uh, in helping get people know about neighborhood policing Great. I, I think it would be very beneficial. Thank you. And that's happening, by the way, and it's great, and we're moving some things. I'm looking at a model expanding to all the NCOs that whatever we learn, we can offer it to other, other neighborhoods with the same demographic. So that's, that's the question. So I'll deal with, I'll work with my, my, uh, the commanding officer, and then we can bring that to you directly. Is that, is that, that, a that would be great. You know, uh, this is what I always say, you know, there are, suggestions, ideas, uh, uh, things that are going on in one precinct that I need to take advantage of and make sure that it's being done citywide. So I welcome any types of suggestions and ideas that you may have, sir. And, and so to, to finalize that, and I'm going to go to my last question, uh, I think that the training for, for what you just presented is, is really great in, in terms of constituent case management, how to, how to take an idea or a question, uh, a comment, return it with your information and a follow-up. I think what I'm asking for is, is another kind of, of m organizing a meeting, an effective nature of a meeting, and the things that you need for a meeting to be successful, mm -hmm. how you present uh, an agenda that can be given out beforehand so people can prepare for it. Little things that, that I've learned uh, in my time in the, as a council member in a neighborhood like Sunset Park, it's very specific. You probably could think about the chair. The chair has very specific ways that maybe the Rockaways deals with meetings and how they want to be prepared. But it's and it's different. It's nuanced, and that's information that we'd love to give as elected officials. So that it's 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 transforming, evolving that training from considering case to uh, in crime fighting to add how to run an effective meeting in this particular neighborhood. Can, can I just add one thing, if you don't yeah. mind? Uh, and I, f I feel to uh, identify this. We have community partners assigned to each one of the localized sectors. These community Define par community partners. Okay, so uh, a community partner is uh, somebody who is somewhat a pillar within a certain, within a community. Uh, it could be anybody from a business owner to a religious uh, leader uh, to somebody that's a community-based organization uh, 
uh, individual, and we asked this person to work hand in hand with the neighborhood coordination officer to help develop the relationships, to help promote neighborhood policing, to help uh, situations at the Build a Block meetings. If there is a translation uh, problem, which uh, we do unfortunately have, and these community partners are very instrumental in making sure these meetings run smoothly, and they're in attendance, and they're a big part of it, and it's, uh, it's paying dividends. Uh, do they do they get funding from the NYPD? They, they do not. They so this do is not. a volunteer this is a, operation. This is a volunteer. This is a volunteer position. Once again, it's this we we want we want people that want to work with the yeah. NYPD. And Absolutely. And we and we scrutinize no doubt. individuals who are, are part of this position. If they if they're not yeah. doing it uh, the way we like them to do it, then we will find somebody else. Got it. The only thing I want I want to offer there that makes it a little tricky and work around immigration. Uh, and in a time where, where people are afraid to go to their government, specifically their NYPD, uh, and that, that, that strain is real in our neighborhoods, people are not reporting as much as, as they want to, and that, that affects your crime, uh, 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 that affects your way to, to address crime in a neighborhood. The, the, the resources around translation and access, language access, are intense. So it's not just like, oh, I, I know X, Y people, you should invite them. It, it, it's a structural need that has resource intensive needs as well. Uh, hiring a translator, uh, to be the, the dignity of a translator to be able to walk in and be trained and understand the vocabulary, and that, that requires a professional person to come in and, if you want to do it right. Mm -hmm. So I want to work with you to kind of bring that, that in, and we're doing it in other, in other spaces that can offer the best opportunities for discussion and trust. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to prep you for that. That might, that might be a, a, a request for money and budget to amplify that partnership. Mm -hmm. And I want to work with the chair to think about how, how we do that. And I think it's the dividends on that is not just from a volunteer, but a professionalization of that relationship with community. I don't know what it looks like, but I'm just going to offer that as feedback. Mm -hmm. The final thing is a lot of our members in Sunset Park talk about the uniformed nature of the NCO officers themselves. And I think you might have asked that earlier, but the way that I'm thinking about it is creating a, an opportunity for the NCO officers while the build a back, uh, 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 build, uh, block, build a 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 block, <laughs> build, build, <laughs> build a block uh, meetings can offer an opportunity for the officers to come in in plain clothes and run a meeting uh, without that intimidation. Walking the streets is one thing, but a, a community meeting might, might be different if these officers, and I don't know who makes that decision. I think of community, the, what we've got, because we've asked this question, is that community fairs are the only ones that are allowed to do that. Could we give them that opportunity just for these meetings so that we can open them up and make it more comfortable for people? Uh, you know, I was, uh major part in the whole identifying how the neighborhood coordination officers should wear their uniforms. And uh, we want the neighborhood, co neighborhood coordination officers to, once again, I'll say this over and over again, we want them to be the police. We want them to be seen the way they're going to uh, patrol the streets every single day. And I, I think that if there is an intimidation factor, it's just the basic uh, course, the human course that happens. But once there's dialogue and, and conversation, there's a comfort level that comes along with it. And that's why we're having these localized meetings. And that's why we're putting the same cops in the same area. Because once these relationships are built, then that fear factor goes away. So you know, in, in regards to putting the same cops in the same area and keeping them in the same uniforms was a, was a strategy because those are the uniforms that they're going to be uh, wearing when they're out patrolling the streets and keeping the community safe. You reminded me of one thing that um, I, I think I want to I want to I want to disagree with you there, but let's keep talking about about that because I think I think it's worth that um, the conversation is worth having. But uh, what what became very apparent in Sunset Park on Fifth Avenue around the street vendors getting um, uh, having operations around the street vendors, it was the NCO officers that were sometimes the ones that were removing the street vendors from the street, and it created a animosity. And I think the street vendors are are some of the most uh, equipped with eyes to share information, and that kind of overnight was removed from the officers. Mm -hmm. And so the request from the street vendors would be something like, 
could the NCO, NCO officers not be the ones that enforce this particular thing, have somebody else do it so they can maintain that relationship and that, that line of communication? Because literally they're on the street every day watching and they, they, they tell me things, but I, I don't wanna have to be that only link to the officers and it destroys the opportunity for true crime fighting opportunities in the neighborhood. Well, once again, uh as a council, I think uh, having that neighborhood coordination officer, the ones who were assigned to that that block where these vendors are, um, then it may not be such a, a contentious situation between that officer and that individual. And that could just be just we're talking about vendors. We could talk about uh, other things that may go on throughout the city. But I, I think if the officers are there every single day, and there's a relationship there, the request, the mediation between that officer and that individual, I think it goes a lot more cohesive because of the, that, they're, that they know one another. Well, let's keep talking. Thank you so much for your time and, and your work on this, on this project. I think it's incredible and it's Thanks. changing the way that we're working uh, together in our neighborhood. And my focus on immigration uh, or immigrant communities is, is one that, that I think can help do our, our work together. So thank you, Chair, for opportunity to ask questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, it's just some follow-up from that. So have you thought of having officers wear anything, uh, NCOs in particular, that would allow the public to identify them? Or is the overall goal really to just, we want the public to view every officer, uh, you know, as an NCO to a great degree? Well, um, so how would the public know? Well, um, once again, it's, just, uh, it's not just the, the NCO who we're asking to uh, be a lot more community oriented. We're asking every police officer to put this this new philosophy forward. So we don't want to separate. Hey, just the NCOs are the only ones that are supposed to be this new uh, friendlier police officer. We also have the steady set of cops that we're asking them to get that off radio time and be very much uh, plugged into the the localized uh, residents as well. So we don't want, to, once again, this is because the, we don't want to say, hey, you're an NCO, your job is to be community friendly and, take, and change your uniform and, hey, you're gonna look a little bit different. We want all our cops to look the same and everybody take this, this new philosophy going forward. And that's why I think metrics are so important. You know, it's like clubs in the neighborhood, right? Like every few months, police comes in, does a great job, and addressing a an issue and then all you before you know it the name comes down off the board and then uh, they change the name but it's the same ownership mm -hmm. right so that's what we're trying to get at I think here is that we want to make sure that we're not just changing the name you know they're going from regular patrol officers to neighborhood coordinating officers but still sort of dealing with the public in the same way and I'm not saying they're doing it I think as Vanessa said as well that these meetings, I think the Builder Block meetings have been phenomenal. And I, I've also will acknowledge that uh, we, you're definitely reaching new people in those meetings, people that we're unaware of. Quite frankly, it makes our life easier because we don't have to do as much community meetings and uh, arranging NYPD meetings where we gotta get clearance because you're doing it and we could show up. So there's a political benefit to this as well. Um, I'll also say, um, uh, to a great degree, just appreciating what you do. You know, a lot of times my office would have had to deal with some of these issues. So we are grateful. The more successful you are, the lighter the load, which will never be light for my office, um, uh, it gets. Um, so that gets me to this question of um, uh, what is the interaction with city agencies? So um, quality of life, is there a, a, a guide, a book, a guide or something of that nature in which NCOs have been trained on this agency does this, um, the speed hump request, do they know to get in touch with the Department of Transportation? So their training that specifically teaches them or trains them on what each city agency does and how to interact with those agencies? Yeah, so, uh, you know, Career investigation, a criminal investigation course, NCO training, uh, mediation training, public speaking training. Within the NCO training, that is one of the the, the most important. One. It's a four-day training, and we capitalize on giving the the NCOs uh, 
the information regarding how to work with the different agencies. So they get, in hindsight, constituent service training. Correct. Great and okay. ab absolutely. And uh, problem solving. That's what, yeah. the, that's what the NCOs do. So mm -hmm. if they can't take care of the issue themselves, and we'll, I, I, I like the, the agency you used, uh, if they have to have a speeding problem, they'll reach out to the Department of Transportation and say, hey, listen, we need a, we need a speed bump here. Mm -hmm. and, and they are, uh, they have the knowledge now how to get in contact with that certain agency. If there is a uh, garbage situation where people are just dumping their, their items at a, at a certain location, you know, we have the mm -hmm. ability to reach and out to sanitation. Mm -hmm. Hey, we have to, mm -hmm. uh, situation when it comes to um, uh, the youth or whatever, we get in contact with ACS or whatever, whatever our, our, our needs may be. Uh, we want to make sure that the cops know how to get in contact with the, with the appropriate agency. Um, let's go back to schools for a second. So can you just run down? So obviously we have the, um, the NCO program, school safety, I think neighborhood school safety agent program. Um, so w what is their role? So they go into a school, and I assume most school safety agents know who kids are. I know they knew my name on a first name basis when I went to Jamaica High School. Um, but I'm interested in, in knowing what does that look like? Are they surveilling or, or are they, how do you get information from teenagers and what does problem solving look like? Um, within the school community? What problems are you addressing? Is it getting intel to stop a fight, or um, can you just speak to what does that look like a little bit more? Mr. Are, you, Jeff, are you, they having school lunch yeah. with the kids? And, you know, so just want to hear a little bit more about that. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I have uh, an executive from uh, school safety here that will maybe give you a little bit of a better breakdown. Awesome. Hello. And you'll just state your name for the record. Uh, push your button. There you go. Captain LaVonda Wise from School Safety Division. All right. Okay, so basically we have school coordination agents in every high school. It can range from one to two school coordination agents. We also have mobile school coordination agents that gives extra assistance to middle high, middle high school campuses and also elementary schools. Basically what the school safety agents are doing is developing relationships, um, enhancing the trust between parents, uh, students, staff, school administ administration. We're looking for them to be a resource to the students. We want them to feel comfortable enough to come to them to let them know when there is a situation, whether it's issues on social media, especially with girls, this one talking about this one, and then kind of mediate that situation with school administration. We're looking for them to participate in the PTA meetings. We're looking for them to um, participate in the after school events, when they have basketball games, football games, where they might be rivalry uh, teams there. We're looking for them to kind of deescalate those situations. Right, and uh, you said social media, so they're surveilling social media or no? Or or no, like the students will come to them and say, you know, it's issues on social media, this, this student is complaining about this student, it might possibly be a fight after school. We want them to kind of remedy that situation before it actually happens. And, uh, and going back to the question of metrics, how do you, and how are these school safety agents uh, selected as their criteria? I guess I'll, I'll raise that as well. Okay, so some of them was elected actually because the DOE, the principals actually recommended them. Okay. So we have to take that into account because most of the school safety agents in high school campuses were already previously assigned at that location. So if they already had that great relationship with the principal and the principal recommended them, that's, that's actually an easy selection to make. Then we also have the volunteers. We vet their applications by looking at their sick record, their discipline um, history, uh, any complaints that have been made against them, also their work experience, and are they a good fit for this program? Right, all right, that's um, good. And, um, and once again, going back to metrics, Mm -hmm. Do you know if they're doing their job? How do you know they're doing their job? Uh, we have we get the success stories from the school coordination agents. We also have a supervisor of school security that oversees the program in the Bronx East Command. He actually goes out to each of the high school campuses and sits down with school administration to see how is it going. Is there anything else that we could possibly do different? Uh, we also speak to the parents at the PTA meetings. What are their thoughts about it? That's okay. how we measure the success. And how has uh, retention rates been in your particular program? This program just rolled out for the school right, year, 2018, right. 2019. So everybody is still part so of the, the program. Jury's out on that. And is that in every school so far? No, we're just in the Bronx East Command. Okay. When do you anticipate it to be in every command? 
we're still evaluating the program, and then once we finish the evaluation, then we'll decide how we're going to proceed with the rollout. So do you anticipate, based on this evaluation, that it would be in all schools, or if Eventually. it doesn't work out? No, it's going to no. it's, it's it's work out? You're yeah, this is a phenomenal program. This is positive. Okay. Um, okay, let me go back to you for a quick second, Chief Harrison. Um, so one of the complaints I often get, and, and obviously my own experiences in the neighborhood, is sometimes undercover officers or officers from other jurisdictions, jurisdictions come into a community don't know if there's a shooting or something of that nature, or if there's been continuous gang violence. Um, you know, outside units come out. So, for example, if special narcotics is coming in to take some kind of action, do they check in uh, to clear it with NCOs in their local community first, or do they just come in and do their thing? Is it, do they work? I mean, if it's vice, for instance, well, vice would be a part of narcotics. I'm sure they're part of that, but. What does that look like with coordinating um, the work that an NCO um, is doing already in the local community? So sometimes with the investigative units that come within the command, they have to do collaborative intel and they cross paths with the neighborhood coordination officers, once again, who have intimate knowledge within the, within the sector. Doesn't mean that it always happens. Uh, sometimes some of the investigative units have to uh, do things on, on, without uh, notifying any of the uh, local, localized, assigned police officers, the NCOs. Uh, but more often than not, uh, the NCOs have, do have knowledge and they share information regarding uh, some type of undercover operation that may be going on within the sector because the NCO may be able to give them intelligence that may be helpful regarding uh, uh, the, the investigation. And would you say that's often or? As, as definitely uh, more often than not. Okay. And are you concerned when these outside units come out? Because I know that, once again, we're trying to um, create a, a new perception of the good work that the men and, the, and men and women of the NYPD are doing. Sometimes these investigative units come in very heavy-handed. Um, so are you um, concerned that with the stroke of them coming in that they can undo partnerships you're trying to forge with local communities. And this is a, a broader conversation for another day, but um, often this does happen sometimes in, in local communities. I, I'm not sure if these uh, investigative units uh, come in heavy handed. Uh, the one thing that I, I will say is. Um, I'll tell you from my experience, they do uh, sometimes. Well, you know, the, yeah. there's always going to be one or you know, two exceptions to every rule, and I'm sure it's, it's unfortunate. But uh, the one thing that I do ask, Mr. Chair, is uh, just we, we shouldn't paint every situation with a broad brush. I think uh, the, the investigative units have been very instrumental in uh, their focus with uh, precision policing, identifying the, the, the head of the snake of some of these problematic localized crews and, and, mm -hmm. and making sure we uh, conduct a proper investigation and uh, get them off the streets. And that's one of the, the major reasons of success uh, within, this, uh, within this department is uh, targeting the right individuals and making sure that they, they don't play some of the areas anymore. Sometimes there, there, are, there is collateral damage, however. So for instance, when there are big raids, perhaps, and a lot of people are rounded up in communities, and I know this is a whole other conversation for another day. I don't want to divulge into that totally. But are you concerned that sometimes when these things do happen, you know, what role would the NCOs play after a big raid or something of that nature where the community, perhaps, especially big raids, although they're not, I haven't heard of any big scale ones recently, but how would then the NCOs interact with the local community after something like that? So one of the things that the neighborhood clinician officers have been doing is having, uh, they're called a briefing uh, takedown uh, conversation okay. with people mm -hmm. from that area. And I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just use a, uh, I, no, I'm not going to use a certain area, but uh, these officers are making sure they inform the community about the investigation, uh, mm -hmm. the results of what has happened, and some of the individuals, uh, the, the, the judicial process that some of these individuals are going to have to go through. So uh, it's something that we haven't done before. This is why I, I love this new philosophy because it's better dialogue, the relationships, the relationships are there, and the NCOs are 
or prepared to talk to the residents about some of these these takedowns that, uh, unfortunately, in the past, we might have had question marks about. Right. And I just want you to think of that. I'm not, I don't have any clear examples of that, um, but just being mindful that, you know, when there is, when there is collateral damage in, in some cases, um, that, you know, they could lead people to question, <laughs> is, is, is neighbor, have we really shifted gears? So just, I think, having a sharper strategy around that in case it does, it does come up. Um, last question, um, um, how, and this is probably a softer question, um, you know, so I think Carlos spoke of how do we get everyday people out, you know, what has your strategy been around, um, uh, around getting people to the public meetings? Um, so I know social media flyers, utilizing leaders such as myself, um, just want to hear a little bit more about that. Are you spending money on ads? Um, is, are you primarily um, using social media as a vehicle, which I'm not here to say is a bad thing. I think that that's been useful as well. But just want to hear an overall broader strategy on how you're getting the community to know about the NCO program. Okay, so Mr. Chair, we've, we've come up with different, different strategies, uh, everything from uh, passing out flyers at our uh, at the local arteries, be train stations, bus stops, uh, and to uh, utilizing uh, the, the you know, social media platforms. Uh, every single precinct has Facebook, Twitter, and uh, we promote uh, some of the upcoming meetings uh, through these social media platforms to make sure we get a, a nice, robust attendance at each one of the. Build the block meetings. If I could just talk about the build the block meeting for one second, uh, each priest, each sector has one build the block meeting every three months. So one of the things we promote is for them to get a location in, in advance and then start promoting this meeting uh, months, or months or weeks prior to the event, so they get a, a good a good attendance there. Uh, we also uh, request our elected officials to be very instrumental in getting people in attendance and we also ask them to be a part of the Build a Block meeting and talk about things that are going on within uh, the, the area that they are elected, elected to. So it's, uh, it's a little bit of, a, of an octopus philosophy. We have a lot of different arms that are, are involved in promoting the Build a Block meetings uh, and it's, it's paying off dividends. If I could just read off some numbers to you, if you don't sure. mind real quickly. Sure, I like so, numbers. Um, We've had nearly 1,700 Build a Block meetings uh, where we've had more than 34,000 people in attendance. And over the, f uh, over the f uh, past few months, we've averaged 84 Build a Block meetings each month. So that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, and once again, is each Build a Block meeting is going to be different from the other ones because each one has its own concerns and, own, and different issues that need to be addressed with the NCO and the, and the residents that are served there. Well, let me um, start off once again by commending Commissioner O'Neill, commending you, Chief Harrison, and all of your staff for, for really um, looking towards this new uh, philosophy. I look forward to, to continuing to work with you um, to critique, positively critique, uh, however you want to take that, uh, the program, which I think, once again, uh, would enable us to have a stronger program and more robust program that will certainly reach communities in a way like I, like it's st certainly starting to do. And I think point and proof is what you've said. I've had the honor of going to, I want to say at least 10 of these meetings around Queens, around the borough, and I'll tell you the turnout is phenomenal at each and every one of them, 100, 200 people. Um, so I think that the, the outreach strategy has largely um, been a good one. And, and once again, you are getting individuals out who um, we have not seen at community meetings we do. <laughs> so something is working. And, and, and largely, I've even told my staff, you know, build it block is a model we could even learn from um, in terms of, of some of the ways you're, you're promoting and getting the word out. Um, and with that being said, I also want to once again, say that I think it's important for us to have metrics, and the metrics shouldn't revolve around how many arrests or summonses you've received. It should largely be on 
what are the quality of life issues you've worked on. Um, but I think, uh, you know, as, as I often like to tell my staff, I trust you, but I like to verify. Mm -hmm. So trust and verification is something, um, no offense, I think everyone is trying to do the right thing um, <laughs> within my organization as well. Um, as a leader, if we're going to talk about it, we must live by it as well. So I think verification is, is the piece that's missing right now, I would say, within the program. Um, and we do trust that the department wants to move in, in the department in a different way um, in terms of community policing and, and recognizing the importance of it. Um, so I want to commend you once again. We look forward to continued work um, in the months ahead to work with you to help you to tell this great story, which should be a beacon and a, 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 a country, a national model for what policing should move to as people from other cities are looking toward what we do here as you know all too well, um, cities all over the country and people all over the world will largely try to navigate towards because we're New York City. So it's bigger than just New York City. We really have an opportunity to be a guiding light for what policing should look like um, in this century. So thank you for the work you've done. Thank you, thank you for ex answering some of the hard questions and we look forward to you answering more of those hard questions as we uh, move along. Couldn't let you get out of here so easily. And I have, oh, I have two witnesses too. So I wanna thank you, Oleg, you okay? All righty, good. All righty, thank you. All right, we have two witnesses. So we'll start with uh, Roberte Cabanas from Urban Youth Collaborative and then Priscilla Grimm. Take a seat, sir. Thank you all for coming. And Priscilla Grimm, if you can come forward as well. And also Roberte Cabanas here up. So you may begin. You'll just uh, sure. press the button and it'll light up. Um, good afternoon. Councilman, my name is Roberto Cabanas, and I'm the coordinator for the Urban Youth Collaborative. I want to start by saying we apologize we couldn't uh, bring some of our young people here today. They have an actually meeting right now uh, with Deputy Chancellor Robinson to talk about some of uh, the school safety priorities. All right, that's good. Um, that I was going to look at the clock and say they should be in school, but wait. <laughs> um, so the Urban Youth Collaborative has been led by youth high school students from across New York City over 10 years. Our youth leaders have come to many of these hearings to testify and share their experiences and hopefully be considered as the most valuable and knowledgeable change agents and stakeholders in education policy and school safety um, because they're experiencing it every day in their schools. Over the last two years, they have organized and worked around the clock to help reframe the narrative of school safety to always start with what young people really need. When the mayor held a town hall following the tragedy in Parkland, our leaders and students of color from across New York City shared exactly what they need. They asked for more guidance counselors and social workers. The city council has been important in increasing the number of guidance counselors and social workers but we still have a long way to go to make sure schools all across the city have the number of guidance counselors and social workers based on need. There are more homeless students in New York City than all of the students in Boston. Every program or initiative about school climate and school safety should begin with significantly increasing the number of support staff that has received years of training on how to meet the social, emotional, and mental health needs of students. Young people were clear they wanted more access to mental health supports in their schools. We understand there's a Thrive program in New York City, but it's not connecting many students to mental health support or resources in their schools. Students often don't see mental health support until they're in, they are in trouble or have already been removed from their classrooms. All the students of color in, in the town hall expressed their concern 
with the level of policing and surveillance they feel in and around their schools. This is reflective of how the communities have been policed forever and new initiatives that are supposed to be more community friendly don't address the systemic issues. This is why our youth are asking the city to envision schools without a police force. We need the city council to seek oversight on current policing practices. What about accountability and transparency in school policing has been addressed? Has the city addressed the recent report in BuzzFeed that demonstrates there are dozens of officers, school safety agents working in schools that have substantiated cases of using excessive force or other forms of misconduct? Where are those officers? Are they still working around children? Has the city put in place change in discipline for officers, agents who have misconduct incidents in schools? Over 20 years of research shows that if you want to end the school to prison pipeline, you don't increase the role of law enforcement officers in school, you reduce their role and make the lines very clear. This program is going to create a huge gray area where students could potentially believe they are sharing personal information with school employees when they're actually sharing personal imp uh, information with employees like the NYPD. That feels like intentional betrayal or trust of students and families. This feels like another example of the city ignoring the root of the issue and moving forward without addressing the changes that are really needed. I implore the city council to urge the city to slow down on this program and move our schools towards centering staff trained in mental, social, and emotional health to build stronger relationships with students and their communities. Finally, listen to the young people. I mean, they come to every hearing. They really have the solutions that they believe work and they know that are working in their schools. Um, their vision might seem or sound radical to folks, but it's grounded in their belief in each other and their hope that we will always see their full humanity. Thank you for your testimony. Hello, my name, sorry. My name is Priscilla Graham. Um, I am a resident of Flatbush, Brooklyn right now. I have lived in New York almost 20 years. I lived for the first um, 18 years in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, and then I moved to Flatbush. Both neighborhoods have the approximate amount of crime. If you look at the NYPD's own statistics that they publish on their precinct pages. However, in Flatbush, Brooklyn, we have at least 10 times the amount of presence on the streets with cars, squad cars with their lights flashing 24 seven on nearly every corner, flashing into our living rooms, into our bedrooms, terrorizing our children on the way to school. You know, my daughter thinks that she is all of a sudden in this huge crime zone. And when you actually look at the actual numbers, it's exactly the same as it was in Sunset Park. And it seems that the omnipresence of the NYPD in my neighborhood serves only to terrorize the residents. I have attended build the, block, build the Block meetings. I have attended community council meetings, both with the statistics printed out that I brought with me. When I asked them why we had 10 times the amount of police presence on the streets in Flatbush versus Sunset Park, I was told that there was an increase in crime, that, that the area had more crime. When I actually pulled up both reports from the 77th precinct and from the 68th precinct and said, that's not true, that is actually a lie that you're perpetuating, perpetuating in this meeting, this public meeting, I was told by the commanding officer of the 68th precinct that those are just numbers. Then I ask, what is the plan to get the squad cars off the street with their flashing lights that are doing nothing but serving for visual pollution bringing those lights into our homes when we're not criminals. And he says- These are the car? Uh, these are the car lights. Car, okay. And in fact, I've been working as a volunteer with a group called Equality for Flatbush. We have a social media campaign called No Community Occupation. And for nearly 10 months now, myself and about 15 other bloggers 
have been taking pictures of where the cop, cop cars are. I can tell you right now that if you go to Rogers and Martins in, um, in Flatbush, the same squad car has been there since January of this year. It has not moved. On my corner, on Nostrand and Linden, this same squad car has been there for the last 10 months. Um, I have asked my uh, local officers, who I guess are the community officers that you spoke of today, when that's going to end so that I'm not assaulted or my neighbors aren't assaulted by this image on our way home from work every night. And he says, well, we're just here for presence. And I'm like, but it's obviously not needed. This is a safe neighborhood. And he says, this is the way it is. And so what is the point of the build the block meetings? What is the point of the community council meetings? If when neighbors approach you and say, just by your own numbers that you are publishing, there is no reason for you to be there, you say it's just numbers. What's the point? I'm just here as a person who's very concerned that my daughter is being conditioned to think of herself as a criminal. And I'm also here to support his testimony that we don't need more police in the, the schools. We need to have more investment into our children. I'm very disturbed by this. It's so unfair and terrible and upsetting. Okay, thank you for your testimony. If you could, uh, uh, Jordan is here from my staff, he'll take your information and I, I don't wanna promise you anything because that's not what I do. Um, I think who's the, we'll find out who the local council member is and then we'll certainly follow up. I would so love see to, us on the thank side. you. Thank you all for your testimony. With that being said, I wanna thank everyone for coming out today at a public safety hearing. I wanna thank the NYPD and all the individuals who testified today. This hearing is now closed.